Now, today's sutta is entitled Dhananjani Sutta. I've given the prefix Majima to make this sutta unique so we can know exactly which sutta we're talking about. There are a couple of Dhananjani Sutta. There's one more about um, his uh, another teaching given to him by the Buddha. So this one is in the Majima Nikaya. So we call it Majima Dananjani. The middle length is called the Dananjani, who is a Brahmin. And this is M97. Notice in, in this series, we study lots of Majima Suttas because you, we have spent two years studying so many Suttas. So, so how time flies. This is our third year studying Suttas. Amazing. So we have spent almost the whole of the COVID pandemic period building up this good karma, studying suttas. Now in this sutta, it is Sariputta who is teaching this Brahmin, Dhananjani, who is a devotee of his. So let's look at uh, what happens. Okay? Now in this sutta is interesting, especially if you're doing counseling, or you're teaching, if you're a monk, you're teaching people. So this is a very beautiful sutta about tolerance, about compassion, we often hear of the Sariputta as being the wisest of the monks. But what is not said, but often shown in the suttas, is that Sariputta is also the most compassionate of the monks after the Buddha. Right? So in this sutta, you see uh, Sariputta's compassion also. All right, let's look at the sutta now, further down. Page 67. There you are. So now you can see when this very fast. Sorry, it's but with the, uh, this, uh, this found no? Majima Dhananjani Sutta. The middle line is called the Dhananjani M97. So remember either the, sutta, the M97, the Sutta number, or the SD number. SD number you can see on the even page at the top left hand corner, SD 4.9. SD 4.9, that means SD volume 4, Sutta 9, eh? uh, which was done in the year 2004. That's the first translation, 2004. Okay, so I went through many revisions. Thus have I heard, at one time the Blessed One was staying in the squirrel's feeding ground in the bamboo grove near Rajagaha. Now remember, this bamboo grows given by King Bimbisara to, to the monks. And this bamboo grows quite big. And part of it is the squirrels feeding ground. And that means there are lots of Indian squirrels there. And people go there to, to feed them. So this is the, like the, the, the we call it the location of the teaching. But uh, the story moves to different places. No? So the story starts, the narrator tells us, okay, the Buddha was, staying in this place, in the bamboo grove. At that time, the Venerable Sariputta was wandering in the southern hills, in Dakinagiri, in stages on the teaching tour with a large community of monks. Now the southern hills, if you look at the map of India, you will see India like a triangle, and in the center of the triangle, there's a place called a Deccan, Deccan Plateau. Okay, so the Deccan Plateau is the southern hills. In fact, the word Deccan comes from Dakina. Dakina, Iri means hills. No? So the Buddha was like a little bit south of the usual place where, the, where uh, of the Holy Land no? of northern central India. Then a certain monk who had spent the rains retreat at Rajagaha went to the southern hills and approached the Venerable Sariputta. Having approached the Venerable Sariputta, he exchanged friendly words and cordial greetings with the Venerable Sariputta. When the friendly greetings were concluded, he sat on at one side. Sitting, sitting thus at one side, the Venerable Sariputta said to him, I was so, friend, is the Blessed One well and fit? Okay, how is the Blessed One, All right? So here we see Sariputta is in the south, and the Buddha is in the north. So this monk has come from Rajagaha. He met Sariputta. So Sariputta, of course, asks, how is, how is that 
teacher asked the Blessed One. And this monk replies, the Blessed One also is well and fit. Then Sariputta says, I was so, is the community of monks well and fit? Now what about the monks? Okay, are they okay? And also the monk replies, the community of monks, I was so, is well and fit too, right? Well, it's not always the case, of course, but uh, there are times that are, of course, sick monk. But in this case, this polite talk also, so this monk says that they're all okay, they're all right, at least as far as he knows them. Then the, there's something interesting happens. This, this is an example of the compassion of uh, Sariputta. He recalls a friend. He has a good friend, a devotee in Rajaga 2.4. I was so, there is a Brahmin named Dananjani living in the Tandula Pala Gate. This is one of the areas of the city. I was so, is that Brahmin Dananjani well and fit? Okay. So how is this Brahmin? Okay. Then the monk replies, the Brahmin Dananjani, I was so, is well and fit. All right. So here notice just this part, Sariputta is asking after, we say asking after all these uh, people, beginning with the Buddha. All right. So you see, it's a very gentle, compassionate person. And then comes the Dharma aspect, 2.5. Sariputta asks, who so? Is the Brahmin Dananjani mindful? Okay, <laughs> is he mindful? Right, so th this is the beginning of the sutta. No? So here, a good man will ask this, this sort of question. It's not easy to answer. It, how, do, how do we say this? No? So here, the monk replies, how can the Brahmin Dananjani be mindful? I was so. The Brahmin Dananjani, I was so, uses the Raja to plunder the Brahmin house masters and uses the Brahmin house masters to plunder the Raja, right? So what's happening here is uh, this monk is reporting to Sariputta, oh, you know, this Dananjani, he's using uh, the king to, to get things done, you know, gets benefits from the people and using the people to get benefits from the king. So it's kind of very politically charged situation for its own benefit, right? So it's not a very mindful situation. And how did this happen, right? So, so this uh, monk reports to Sariputta, he says, his wife, a person of faith, coming from a clan of faith has died and he has taken another wife one faithless coming from a faithless clan. All right, so it says, well, he's like that because his wife is, is not a Buddhist, is, has no faith. Oh, so what bad news indeed that we hear our soul, says Sariputta. What bad news indeed that we hear our soul, that Dananjani has become heedless. Perhaps we should sometime meet Dananjani for a dialogue. Ah, notice here, this is amazing. Okay, you can must you must remember this part. Eh? Sariputta says, I have to see this Dananjani. All right. So this is where in, in modern uh, social work we say Sariputta is socially engaged as a monk. Okay. He doesn't socialize, but he's socially engaged, meaning he thinks of the people who has been supporting him, especially when they are not mindful. So in the case of Dananjani, he was a good man and his good wife died. Now he's a new wife. The new wife is not very good and, and he's living a very messy life. So this is the background to the story. All right, now Sariputta goes to Rajagahi. He leaves uh, Southern Hills, all right? Then the venerable Sariputta, having stayed in the Southern Hills for, for as long as he wished, set out for Rajagaha and walking in stages, eventually reached Rajagaha. There the Venerable Sariputta resided in the squirrel's feeding ground in the bamboo grove near Rajagaha. 
so where the Buddha also is residing. Now here, imagine you're reading, reading this story, <clears throat> and we're talking about this Sariputta who is hundreds of kilometers down south. So he has to walk all this distance to Rajagaha, right? So it takes many days, yeah? many weeks. So that we must also bear in mind. So things go a little slow those days. So there's no modern transportation like train or the monks don't use horse carriage and they walk. So this is also for their good health. Four. Then when it was morning, the Venerable Sariputta, having dressed and taking bowl and robe, entered Rajagaha for arms. Okay, so this is the, notice how Sariputta meets Tananjani. Sariputta goes for arms. He's a monk, see? Now at that time, the Brahmin Tananjani was having his cows milked in a cow shed outside the city. And if you remember at the start of this, uh, today's class, there is a picture of Dananjani milking his cow, right? There's a carving. 4.2. Then the Venerable Sariputta, having walked for arms food in Rajagaha, having returned from his arms round after his meal, approached the Brahmin Dananjani. Okay, not the time also. He have his, he takes his arms meal first, and then only he sees uh, this Dananjani. Eh? He, he didn't go to Dananjani's house directly, although he knows Dananjani because he knows the situation is not that good. Eh? The Brahmin Dananjani saw the Venerable Sariputta coming in the distance. Having seen the Venerable Sariputta approaching, went up to him and said this, Here, Master Sariputta, Drink some fresh milk since there is still time for your meal, right? So this probably maybe there is still like half an hour to one hour, you know. I mean, like, it, for example, even in Malaysia, uh, although it's like 12 noon here, but uh, it's 12 o'clock, but it's not noon yet. The sun is not directly overhead yet. So there's still some time. That's the meaning here. It's, the sun hasn't crossed the meridian, right? But then Sariputta has already finished his meal. So Sariputta doesn't want to take any more since he has finished his meal. So Sariputta says 4.3, enough Brahmin, I have finished my meal for today, right? So here again, you see he's a very disciplined person. He, he respects the Vinaya, although he can if he wants to, but here he says I've already finished my meal for today. I will be spending the afternoon rest at the foot of that tree. I suppose here you got to imagine it says that tree. So it's probably pointing in the direction. There's a tree. You may go there, right? So it was basically telling Dananjani, I want to talk to you. Okay, please come afterwards. And then Dananjani says, Yes, Master. The Brahmin Dhananjani replied, innocent to the Venerable Sariputta. <clears throat> then the Brahmin Dhananjani, having finished his morning meal, approached the Venerable Sariputta. I notice again, uh, in the case of Dhananjani, he too takes his meal quite late. Eh? Having a, uh, that is, he took his meal after after noon, after Sariputta. Then everything is the same here. You can see the Aitari signs, right? So that means he approached Sariputta, and respect, shows respect, bowing down to him. While the Brahmin Dharanjani was seated thus at one side, the Venerable Sariputta said this to him. Okay, now comes that crucial question. <laughs> Sariputta asked, are you mindful, Brahmin? <laughs> Are you mindful? Are you mindful, Brahmin? Okay. Notice only someone like the Buddha or Sariputta can ask this kind of question. Of course, a good monk will still be able to ask this question to a lay devotee. Okay. Are you mindful, devotee? Right? 
that is a very wonderful question, a very caring question, very Dharma spirited question. Then it is uh, Dhanajani's turn to speak. So he is going to tell Sariputta the real situation. He is giving excuses. He's giving this very, uh, what should I say, a very clever excuse, if you like, or, or not so clever excuse. 5.2. Master Sariputta, how can I be mindful when I have parents to support, wife and children to support, slaves and laborers to support, service towards friends and companions to discharge, duties to relatives and blood relations, duties to my guests, duties to my departed to ancestors, duties to the gods, duties to the Raja and the bodies needing satisfaction and care. Right? So it's quite a long list of layman things to do. So it shows that he's quite an important person, quite a rich person. But we're talking about 2,500 years ago. He probably is living in a small village, but he's, he knows the Raja, he knows a lot of people. And he's very rich. So he says, uh, I, can't, I can't be mindful. I'm, getting so involved in all these things, right? So this is the reason the Sariputta comes to see him. And then comes the teaching, all right? So now section six, right? Now Sariputta immediately starts talking. But then the approach is very gentle, very gradual, indirect. Sariputta starts by asking what do you think, Dhananjani? What do you think, Dhananjani? Notice, no? in other words, Dhananjani knows this. He knows what's good, what's bad, what's right, and what's wrong. Okay, so Sariputta is using that goodness which is in Dhananjani himself and he has forgotten it or unable to show it. So Sariputta begins by teaching him. Suppose someone here on account of parents were not a dharma fairer who were to live a life of vice, doing not bad things, a life of vice. And because of such conduct, the hell wardens were to drag him off to hell. Would he gain anything by claiming, it was on account of my parents that I am not a dharma fairer, that I live a life of vice. Let not the, dharma, let not the hell wardens take me to hell. All right. So, or would his parents be able to gain anything by claiming it was on our account that he was not a dharma fera, that he lived a life of vice? Let not the hell wardens take him to hell. Right. So, so I put the uh, ask two questions huh? to, to Dananjani. So, Dananjani, you are living this life breaking the precepts. Huh? because of your parents, okay, right? So if you do that, what will happen? This, this hell wardens will come, you know, the hell beings will come and drag you to hell, all right? And what can you say? Can, can you tell them, oh, please don't do this. No, I, I, I can't because I'm supporting my parents. Secondly, even if your parents say, Say to the hell warden, say, oh, oh, please don't take him away. Don't go to hell. Nah? Because he, he's doing all this because of us. You think that will help? <laughs> so notice, very important to understand here. Now, don't quote this passage and say, oh, you see from this passage, you have these hell wardens, they come and drag you to hell. This is not what the, this passage is about. Now, how do we know this? Remember the neyata nitata sutta in Anguttara, the I think, Book of Twos, eh? where the Buddha says, when you read the Sutta, you must decide, you must know. In this case, in this Sutta, has the meaning been drawn out? Is the meaning drawn out or the meaning needs to be drawn out? Drawn out, nita, nitata, the meaning already drawn out. In this case, it's a direct teaching. The Buddha says, uh, for example, the eye is impermanent. This, this direct teaching. 
But here, the, this is a story. When you have stories of these hell beings coming and so on, these, these are stories. But this is what Dhananjani understands. This is the belief those days. So Sariputta is just using this teaching, saying, you know, if you are dragged to hell, doing all these bad things, eh? can you use this excuse, oh, I'm doing this for my parents. Or even if your parents, they, they come and, and tell, uh, don't go to hell. Eh? Like, you can also remove all those uh, hell wardens if you like. Is that someone is dying, Donna John is dying, and then uh, his negative thoughts come up. He, he, he cannot do anything. His family also is not able to help him. That's the meaning here. So th this is a, 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 what is called teaching using skillful means, upaya. And uh, Sariputta is talking the language of the Nanjani. All right. So we have to be careful not to simply quote the words here and say, oh, this is what happens, you know, right? These are stories. So you, you see all these stories being transmitted to China. And then you have movies about it. And then you go to Haupa Villa in Singapore, you see all those gruesome uh, uh, cement statues and so on of the hells, right? So this is mythology, right? We don't take it seriously in that way as physical places. These are mental states. The mind suffers, okay? So the story here, the, the passage here means that the, the Sariputta is trying to tell Dhanajani and telling us indirectly, you may do bad for someone else, people you love, people you care for, even for your parents, it's still bad. And even those parents cannot stop this kind of karma and say, oh, they're, he's doing this bad thing for us. This bad karma was still, the result will still be bad. Okay, that's the meaning. This is the way karma works. So this sutta is also about karma. Okay. All right. Then, then after this, uh, we have uh, how many sections? Uh, Ten sections. Eh? Nine more sections. They, they all kind of it's a cycle. The the whole thing repeats. The whole passage. Uh, this is a template, right? And only one phrase, the key phrase changes. So look at seven brackets two. So I put brackets two, the brackets show you this is the second cycle. What do you think, Dananjani? Suppose here, on account of wife and children, well, you were not a Dharma Fara who were to live a life of vice, and because of such conduct, uh, Hell wardens were to drag him to hell, right? So someone here were to say, okay, he's doing bad things. So, oh, I'm doing this for my wife and children. And then this karma ripens. He said, oh, please, Mary, not suffer. I'm doing this for my wife and children. Still, this karma will ripen. Even the wife and children can plead and say, oh, our father is doing all this for us. You know, please don't, may he not suffer, you know. You can't, because the bad karma is bad karma, right? In this case, represented by the hell wardens. The hell warden will still take him away. So this is a story form, you see, right? You see all those Chinese ancient, uh, those Chinese movies, those days that my mother used to take me to see them too, those days. Right, so even if you do something bad for wife and children, the karma still works the same. It will come back to you, right? You cannot take the excuse, oh, I'm doing this for my wife and children. So you have to be very careful. Okay. Then the third cycle, that is number eight. What do you think, the Nanjani? Suppose someone here on account of slaves, laborers, and servants, right? So this time, now, sorry, but this Nanjani has got slaves, laborers, and servants, because he's a rich man, right? So he's doing, he does something bad for them, right? Like, for example, allowing them to steal for him or, or giving them stolen things, for example, right? That also is bad karma. Now, let me explain these three terms, right? You have slaves, laborers, and servants. Slaves, uh, slavery happen, uh, exists in Buddha's time, especially because of debts. So someone owes uh, a lot of money, 
to the family and they can't pay, if the amount is very big, the whole family will have to serve the other family without which, in that sense, they are slaves. Dasa, dasa, okay, slaves. So they have to serve the family because they owe this family. So they don't receive anything. Of course, they receive lodging and food, but they don't receive any pay and they work as unpaid servants. Now, the, what is interesting is that these slaves, they are part of the family. So they can, in other words, they say, oh, I, I can't work today, I'm having a headache. <laughs> they can say that. But a laborer cannot, because a laborer is hired, he's paid. So here he has no choice, he has to work. So this is a difference, okay? So the position of a slave is better than that of a laborer in, in, in the social system of India at that time, right? So these are just words. So don't jump to conclusion the moment you see the word slaves, laborers. Servants are, of course, uh, those who are paid also and they, are, they work in the house on, a, I suppose, longer term, whereas laborers will be shorter term. And laborers do very heavy work, servants, the menial household task. Ne? All right, so here, number cycle three, Dhananjani has been doing the wrong things because of his slaves, laborers, and servants, but the karma is still the same. And the slaves, laborers, and servants cannot say, oh, you know, he's doing this for us, so let him not suffer any bad karma. Now go to the fourth cycle. So this time, it's about friends and companions. Number nine, eh? section nine. What do you think, Dananjani? Suppose someone here, on account of friends and companions, who are not a Dhamma fera, were to live a life of vice, <clears throat> and because of such conduct, the hell wardens <clears throat> were to drag him off to hell, right? So that karma ripens. So you can't stop that. You can stop the fruiting of this karma. And even the friends also cannot stop this. The friends cannot say, oh, you know, he's doing all this thing. Yeah, it's bad, but he's doing it for us, because of us. But still, you can change the situation, all right? The karma works justly all the same to everyone. This is another way of putting it. And then the fifth cycle, this is number 10. What do you think then, Anjani? Suppose someone here on account of relatives and blood relatives were not a Dhamma affair, were to live a life of vice. So someone does bad for relatives and blood relations. Okay, relatives are those uh, directly connected with, with, uh, with us. Blood relations are to marriage. <clears throat> so here, in other words, we do bad because for the sake of relatives, still bad karma. Even the relatives themselves cannot plead and say, okay, may this karma not happen. 11, section 11 is cycle number six, and this time is the guess. What do you think, Don Anjani? Suppose someone here on account of the guests were not a Dhamma Fara who were to live a life of vice and so on. Right? So here, we should not do bad, even using our guests as an excuse. For example, to kill, steal, whatever, because we have guests present. And the guest also cannot intercede. The guest cannot say, oh, he's doing all these bad things because of us, so may he not suffer. Right? So karma doesn't work that way. You do bad, it's bad. No, it's not a matter for whom it is, it's still bad. Now comes something now beyond society, something away from society. Section 7, this are about the departed ones, about ancestors. What do you think, Dananjani? Suppose someone here, on account of the departed or ancestors, here the word is preta, by the way. So we cannot translate preta here as that was preta beings. Eh? Here it means the departed, those who have passed away, ancestors. So here, Sariputta is teaching Dharanjani, he says, you know, if you do something bad, say you do prayers for your departed ones, but you do it wrongly, you know, there is killing and so on. So still bad karma, right? And then the... So now here is something interesting. It's, it's so tricky to explain. Look at 
or would the departed be able to gain anything by claiming it was on our account that he was not a Dharma fellow, that he lived a life of vice, that not the hell wardens take him to hell. Now, so here you got to imagine. So even if these ancestors, these ancestors, they are reborn elsewhere, they plead. Here the teaching means that even for the sake of your departed ones, even if they uh, have this voice, they claim that you're doing it for them, karma is still karma. They cannot change it. Even the departed ones cannot change it. Your ancestors cannot change it for you. These are for those who believe in ancestors, right? So you got to use imagination a bit here. The, the, the Sariputta is covering all the bases, as we say, of the various beliefs. Make sure that Dhananjani doesn't have any excuse to say, oh, you know, I'm doing this because uh, of my ancestors. Everything is covered. Now comes the Devas, the next, next cycle, cycle eight. What do you think, Dhananjani? Suppose someone here on account of the gods were not a Dhamma pharaoh and who were to live a life of vice and because of such a conduct, the hell wardens were to drag him off to hell. Right, so sometimes someone may say, oh, I believe in this God. So uh, I'm, he goes around killing people, so I'm killing this for my God, you know. Again, it is wrong. Even if, if these gods can come down and say, oh, you know, he's doing it for me. Karma is still karma. So here we see karma even outpowering, even overpowering the gods themselves. You can pray to God and say, God, please help me, do, do, don't punish me, ask for forgiveness. But karma, you can't. Karma works as natural justice. And then you come to number nine, section 14, cycle nine. What do you think, Dhananjani? Suppose someone here on account of the Raja were not a Dharma pharaoh who were to live a life of vice. And because of such conduct, the hell wardens were to drag him off to hell. Right? So here, even if you were to do bad things because of the, of the king, the government, you know, you, you do bad because of powerful people, it's still the same. And even if those powerful people say, oh, it's okay, you know, he's doing it for us, you know, karma will still work on the doer, right? So this is an indirect warning to Dhananjani. And then number 10, cycle 10, that is section 15. What do you think, Dhananjani? Suppose he has, on account of his body's needing satisfaction and care, but not to be a Dharma pharaoh, who were to live a life of vice. And because of such conduct, the hell wardens were to drag him off to hell, right? So here, because of his own health, because of his own needs, personal need, that he's doing all these bad things. Oh, this definitely, karma will still work, right? Oh, and then here, 15.3, or would others be able to gain anything by claiming it was on account of the body's need and care that he was not Adam Afera? So no one else can say, oh, you know, he's, he's only doing it for himself. Well, still, he won't work. Karma will still flow naturally. The fruits will come. You cannot escape karma in this sense. So these are the 10 cycles. And this is the first part of the teaching given to the Nanjani. This is only the background, the starting, right? So the interesting part is coming. So now, just timing is just nice. We'll take a short break and we continue after five minutes, more or less, right? Okay. Thank you, Brad Pia. We'll take a five minutes break now. Brad Pia, I think we can start now. Let's continue, right? Yes. So, all right. So just now in section six of the sutta, what we are looking at is the, what I call the 10 reasons uh, for our our behavior, okay? Uh, whether we do good or we do bad, right? So what Sariputta is teaching us here, he's saying, be careful not to create bad karma with the excuse, with any of these 10 excuses for number one, for parents, number two, for wife and children as family, number three, for co-workers, our, our employees, 
and number four is for friends and companions or social connections, and number five for relatives, and then the six is for guests, people who come to visit us, and number seven is because of our beliefs, ancestors, and so on, and then number eight is for the, the gods. He also believes, but on a different level. And number nine is, is for the powerful people, the rulers, government. And number 10 is uh, for our own personal needs. We should not break the precepts on, on any of this account. Okay, so this is this are example, 10 situations. Now Sariputta continues. This is going to the good part now. Okay, so now comes the good practice part, section 16. Cycle one. So, so here again, we have uh, eight cycles, I think. <clears throat> uh, sorry, we have 10 cycles as, as before. What do you think in Dhananjani? journey? Who is better? One who, on account of parents, is not a Dharma pharaoh who lives a life of vice, who, who does evil, or one who, on account of parents, is a Dharma pharaoh who lives a harmonious life, who lives a uh, who keeps the precepts, basically, right? The answer is obvious, isn't it? So, Johnny replies, <coughs> Master Sariputta, the one who, on account of parents, is, is not a Dharma pharaoh who lives a life of vice, is not the better one. Master Sariputta, the one who, on account of parents, is a Dharma pharaoh who lives a harmonious life, in other words, keeps the precepts, he is the better one. Uh, Master Sariputta, the one who, on account of parents, is a Dhamma Fairy who lives a harmonious life, is surely better. And uh, Dhamma Fairy living a harmonious life, Master Sariputta, is better than not living the Dhamma Fairy life, not living the Dhamma life, living a life of vice. So here you can see this is what Sariputta is doing is reminding Dhananjani of his own goodness. He is by nature a good person. So he knows this. This is better not to do any bad things, even for the sake of our parents. Then Sariputta replies 16.5, Dananjani, there are other kinds of deeds with good cause, righteous, by means of which one could support parents and yet avoid and follow uh, sorry, yet avoid bad and follow the way of marriage, right? So you can still do good for the sake of parents. And what do you think, uh, Dananjani? Who is better, right? The one. So here, let me summarize. So this this person who who does who lives a bad lives, breaks up precepts because of wife and children, or the one who does not break precepts. Who, who live a Dharma life, who is better? Because uh, Dhananjani says definitely that the one who, who lives a moral life because of wife and children is definitely better because there are other ways, right? Sariputta says there are other kinds of work which are good and righteous which can be done. And you know what's interesting here is that this last verse, 17.5, 18.5, 19 19.5 and so on, this verse can be spoken by either Dananjani or Sariputta. The, the teaching is the same, all right? So this is the Dharma practice here. By doing good, one is truly happy. The same goes for slaves and laborers. This is section 18. The, the one who does not do any bad things, who keeps the precepts, né? even for the sake of slaves and laborers, and servants uh, is still better than, than otherwise, right? So we see here a kind of a, the whole cycle starting again. And then the next one is about gas. So the, the better person is the one who won't do any bad things, who still keeps the precepts, even for the sake of gas. <clears throat> then section 12, this person, the better person, is the one who does not do bad deeds, create bad karma, even for the sake of the departed. 
and then section 13, cycle eight, this good person does not even do any bad things, any bad karma, even for the sake of the gods. After believes, he doesn't take as excuse, oh, you know, the gods want me to do this. He will still will do good karma, he will live the Dharma life. And then cycle nine, section 14, even for the Raja in politics, right? He will not do any bad things for the sake of the Raja. Then finally 10, section 15, he will not do any bad things. He will not break the precepts, even for his own personal needs. His body is needing satisfaction and care. So he will still not break the precepts. All right. So uh, the second part finishes here. Now, sec now section six. Uh, so that finishes section 16, isn't it? Okay, so uh, so we have finished up to. I've summarized for you up to twenty five. Okay, so now we're coming near the end already, right? Look at twenty five point four. So Sariputta tells Taranjani that there are other kinds of good that we can do, right? By living. The, the moral life. You don't have to break the precepts on account of these 10 things. So Dhananjani is happy. Section 26. Then the Brahmin Dhananjani delighted in the venerable Sariputta's word and having rejoiced in it, rose from his seat and left. So this concludes the part where Sariputta, uh, Dhananjani meets Sariputta, listens to the Dharma teaching. Right? So after this, there is we, we're not told how long the, the break is, how, how many days, how many weeks or months pass. Because in the next section, Dhananjana is dying. He's going to die. And he invites Sariputta to come and see him. Now, this part is very interesting is because he takes leave of the Buddha, but he invites Sariputta to come and see him. Normally we invite the Buddha, right? So in this case, he invites Sariputta. Who is very, he's very close to Sariputta. 27. Then at a later time, the Brahmin Dhananjani was sick in pain and seriously ill. Then the Brahmin Dhananjani addressed a certain servant, a certain man. He says, come, my good man, approach the Blessed One. Having approached the Blessed One, bow at his feet in my name, saying, Ante, the Brahmin Dhananjani is sick in pain and seriously ill. He bows his head at the Blessed One's feet. Then approach the Venerable Sariputta. Having approached the Venerable Sariputta, bow at his feet in my name, saying, Ante, the Brahmin Dhananjani is sick in pain and seriously ill. He bows his head at the Venerable Sariputta's feet. And say thus, okay, there is something extra to Sariputta. It would be good, Bhante, if the Venerable Sariputta could come to the Brahmin Dhananjani's house out of compassion. So the man, the servant says, yes, Bhante. Notice here, section 27.5, <clears throat> the servant addresses Dhananjani as Bhante. So this is a term, it's like in Malay we say Tuan, sir, okay? Yes, Bhante, the servant replied in a sentence, Dhananjani. So next part, this servant goes to see the Buddha and conveys a message which Dhananjani has sent. 27.7, uh, the Brahmin Dhananjani is sick and in pain and seriously ill. He bows his head at the Blessed One's feet. This is uh, taking leave. Dhananjani knows he's going to die, so he takes leave. If I'm not mistaken, in another sutta, I uh, I'm not sure whether Dhananjani is a stream winner or not. No? But anyway, he, he's, he believes in the Dharma because of Sariputta. So he takes leave of the Buddha. And then the servant approaches Sariputta and tells Sariputta that Dhananjani is dying. And that Dhananjani invites Sariputta to see him before he passes away. 2710, the Venerable Sariputta assented by his silence. Now comes the conclusion where we have what is called bedside counseling, where Sariputta 
gives the last counseling, the uh, death counseling yeah, to Don and Johnny, 28. Then the venerable Sariputta, having dressed himself, taking rope and bow, approached the house of the Brahmin Dhananjani. Having approached, he sat down on the prepared seat. Thus, Sita, the venerable Sariputta, said this to the Brahmin Dhananjani. Now you see square brackets there, M3264, S4, colon 56. These are cross references. You can also refer to this for similar uh, words yeah, for similar sayings, similar sentences. So here again, Sariputta asks after Dhananjani, 28.2. I hope you are bearing it, Dhananjani. I hope you are getting better. I hope your pains are abating, lessening, not rising. That the abating is evident, not there, rising, but Dhananjani is very sick. So then Jani replies, section 29, Master Sariputta, I cannot bear it. I'm not getting better. And my pains are not abating, but rising. Their rising is evident, not their abating. Then he describes his pain in three ways, okay, four ways, 29.2. Master Sariputta, just as a strong man, were cleaving open my head with a sharp sword. Even so, Master Sariputta, violent winds are cutting through my head. Okay, so he feels his head, wow, really headache, no? I cannot bear it. And so on, so he says the pain is very great. And then 29.3, Master Sariputta, just as a strong man, were tightening a strong leather strap around my head as a headband. Even so, Sariputta, Master Sariputta, violent pains are crushing my head, right? So this is really very graphic, no? First there's sharp pain and then throbbing pain, okay? Like, like someone ties a band around the head. And then 29.4, Master Sariputta just as a skilled butcher or his apprentice were carving up a cow's belly with a sharp butcher's knife. Even so, Master Sariputta, violent winds are rending my belly. So he's, he feels there's this sharp pain in his stomach also. So these are life-threatening pains. Isn't it? So he has sharp pains in his stomach also, in his belly. 29.5, Master Sariputta, just as if two strong men were to seize a weaker man by both arms, and burning and roasting him over a pit of burning coal. Even so, Master Sariputta, violent pains are burning up my body. Right, so he has the fever. He feels this heat. So you can imagine, it's a very painful death. No? Uh, Headaches, sharp pains, body pains, feverish pains. So he's dying, okay? Now, Sariputta is very good for this kind of counseling. Because if we really study traditional Buddhism, we look at all these, these are what's called Gati Nimitta. It shows where this, you know, this Dhananjani uh, is going to be reborn. Another case is that of a public executioner. I mean, he has been killing people, right? and Sariputta counsels him, so it helps him to be reborn in a happy state. So here again, because of Sariputta's intercession, this Brahmin is has a chance to be reborn in a happy state. Let's see what happens. Né? Section thirty. So this is Sariputta's bedside counseling, death counseling. What do you think, Dananjani? Which is better? Hell or the animal world? Now this is quite obvious, right? The answer. The animal world, Master Sariputta, is better than hell. What do you think, Dananjani? Which is better? The animal world or the Preta realm? Oh, the Preta realm is better 
master so if we tell it's better than the animal realm what do you think that Johnny which is better the better realm or the human realm the human realm master so if we tell is better than the better realm so here you see a kind of a gradation of the realms no? so the, the the most suffering realms the interestingly is the animal kingdom the pretas they, they still have like they can decide certain things you know and of course human beings is much better then Sariputta goes on to the heavens no? the, the sensual heavens 30.4 what do you think Dhananjani which is better the human world or the devas of the four great kings of course Sarip the Dhananjani replies the four great kings heavens much better so it goes on like that. So next is the heaven of the 33 is better still. And the heaven of King Yama is even better, right? And then higher than that is the, is just look at the bowl print, bowl printing eh, of, on the right, left hand side. Now the devas of the Tusita, Master Sariputta, is, are better than the devas of the heaven of Yama, Tusita heaven. And then even higher, even better than the Tusita heaven, happier are the Nimanarati Devas. These are very powerful gods. They, they are able to create things for themselves. And even higher, happier than them are the Paranimita Vasavati Devas. These are Devas who are able to control others who create things. They don't have to create the order other Devas to create for them. Right, so th these are the up to the what's called the sensual heavens. Uh, and uh, Sariputta asked these questions and then this. Dharanjani answers them, and then it comes to this, the new stage this time is the, what is called the first dhyana world, the form world, section 31. What do you think Dharanjani, which is better? The Paranimita Vasavati Devas or the Brahma world, right? So here there's a switch from the sense world to the first dhyana world. So the devas of the, in the sense world the gods are called devas then after that the first jhana onwards they're called brahmas 31.2 master sariputta you say the brahma world master sariputta you say the brahma world so here it shows that uh Dhananjani is very excited he's very happy he said wow do you mention brahma world okay now sariputta doesn't say anything we are, the narrator tells us what Sariputta thinks, 31.3. Then the Venerable Sariputta thought, these Brahmins are devoted to the Brahma world. What if I were to teach the Brahmin Dhananjani the way to companionship with Brahma? All right, so here <laughs> Sariputta does something very interesting. He decides to give Dhananjani the benefit of the doubt, we might say. Since Dhananjani is so excited and so happy with the Brahma world, so Sariputta says, okay, let, let, let me teach him how to be reborn in the Brahma world, to be happy there. 31.4. Then he said to the Brahmin Dhananjani, I shall teach you the way to companionship with Brahma. Listen, and I'll, I will speak. Yes, Master Sariputta, and so on. Eh? Now, what does Sariputta teach? Dhananjani teaches him loving kindness meditation, the four abodes, the four divine abodes, eh? the four Brahma Vigaras. 32. And what Dhananjani is the way to companionship with Brahma? How is one reborn in the Brahma world? Here, Dhananjani, a monk. Notice, uh, Sariputta is talking to Jana, Dhananjani as a layman, but he uses the word a monk. He means a meditator. So here you have proof to show that the word monk refers to any meditator, right? So here it includes Dhananjani also. Here, Dhananjani, a monk with a heart of loving kindness, dwells suffusing one quarter, so to the second, so to the third, and so to the fourth. Thus above, below, across, everywhere, and to everyone, as well as to himself. He dwells of using all the world with loving kindness. That is vast, <clears throat> grown great or exalted 
immeasurable, without hate, without ill will. This Dhananjani is the way to companionship with Brahma. Okay. Now, strictly speaking, this person should also know how to meditate, go into deep states. Okay, so I suppose Nanjani is able to at least calm himself, attain some level of focus. So notice this is what we did today in the closing, eh? the breaking the barriers. Uh, one quarter, that is the first quarter. So we start with the front. Okay? Normally we start with the east, east and then south, west, north, okay, one round and then uh, above and below. But to make this more universal, the Sutta only says one quarter, right? So here in, the teacher will tell you front quarter. We start with the front, puba. Puba can mean east or can mean front, okay? So from we first send our loving canals outwards in the front direction, and then we go clockwise, left hand direction, the back, and then the left hand side. So these are the four quarters. And then we, we send it above and then below. Okay. Of course we can also do it the other way around, below and above. Across the, this means the directions in between, everywhere, and then to everyone as well as to himself. Okay. So we close by bringing the loving goodness back to ourselves. And this is how we send loving kindness by way of directions. In our practice, we, we do two kinds. We, we, we do the directional one as taught here, and we also do the personal one. We start off with the personal one. We just think of different people, ourselves, and so on. So we, we do two kinds. Yeah? And then the same thing is taught with compassion. So I'll just read through this so that you are familiar with it. But the Dananjani, the monk with a heart of compassion. By the way, notice you, you always must start with loving kindness first. Then you go upgrade to compassion. Dwell further Dana Jani, the monk with a heart of compassion, dwells suffusing one quarter, so to the second, so to the third, so to the fourth. Thus above, below, across, everywhere, and to everyone as well as to himself, he dwells suffusing all the world with compassion. That is vast, grown great, immeasurable, without hate, without ill will. This Dhananjana is the way to companionship with Brahma, right? So here vast, grown great means it, to the level of jhana, to the level of deep concentration. The same is said of gladness, of joy, mudita. And then section 35, the same is said of equanimity, right? Which is done, directed to all the world. Okay, so then 36. In that case, Master Sariputta, I bow my head at the feet of the Blessed One, saying, Bhante, the Brahmin Dharanjani is sick in pain, seriously ill. He bows his head at your feet. Then the Venerable Sariputta, having established the Brahmin Dharanjani in the lowly Brahma world, rose from his seat and left, while there was still a higher task to be done. So this is a note by the narrator, because this is an important lesson also. The narrator tells us that while there is still more to be done, Sariputta left. So this is the controversy in the sutta, that Sariputta left without teaching higher teachings to, to this Brahmin. Then not long after the Venerable Sariputta had left, the Brahmin Dhananjani died and arose in the Brahma world. Right? So it's reborn as a Brahma. So this is the controversy, okay? The Brahmin is only taught the divine abodes and he dies, reborn as a Brahma, not even a stream winner, okay? Okay, now Sariputta has to answer for this. All right, let's look at 37. Then the Blessed One addressed the monks, the Jews. This Sariputta, okay, it's a special, this Sariputta, okay, that was the, uh, something the Buddha is addressing a serious matter. This Sariputta, having established the Brahmin Dhananjani in the lowly Brahma 
world, rose from his seat and left. While there, is, while there was still a higher task to be done, right? So the, the Buddha is just saying this, okay? The Buddha noticed the tone. The Buddha doesn't like show any anger or any, any uh, what do you call it? Reprimanding the Buddha, Sorry, Buddha. He's just making a statement and say, this is what Sariputta did. Okay, 38. Then the Venerable Sariputta approached the Blessed One. So the Buddha said the previous sentence because he knows Sariputta will hear this. He's going to come to see the Buddha. Having approached the Blessed One, saluted him, and then sat down at one side. Sitting thus at one side, the Venerable Sariputta said this to the Blessed One. Bhante, the Brahmin Dhananjana is sick, in pain, seriously ill. He bows his head at your feet. So this is a message that Dhananjani gave to Sariputta. It takes leave of the Buddha. So uh, Sariputta is telling this to the Buddha. <clears throat> then the Buddha replies. Notice the last word is given to, well, almost to the Buddha. No? But in this sutta, actually, the, who has the very last word? Let's look at it. 38.3. Uh, Let me read 38.2 also. But Sariputta, why did you, having established the Brahmin Dhananjani in the lowly Brahma world, rise from your seat and leave while there was still a higher task to be done? So here the Buddha asked Sariputta, in other words, why didn't you teach him at least to attain stream winning, for example, right? So Sariputta explains in a very simple, direct way. Bhante, I thought, Thus, these Brahmins are devoted to the Brahma world. Well, what if I were to teach the Brahmin Dhananjani the way to companionship with Brahma, right? So basically what uh, Sariputta is saying, he seems to be happy with this. So I'm teaching this just to make him happy. Then the Buddha, the last word is given by the Buddha. The Buddha says, and Sariputta, the Brahmin Dhananjani has died and arisen in the Brahma world. Now it's hard to, we're not, it is like a mystery closing. We're not told uh, how the Buddha feels about this. And it doesn't matter. In a sense, the last, the closing sentence is saying Sariputta is successful in his teaching because of what Sariputta taught this Brahmin is reborn. This Brahmin, despite his life of you know all those doing wrong things breaking precept because of his uh, wife who has no faith right he's reborn as a brahma so the buddha is not scolding the brahmins the question now is how do we explain this i've written something in the front okay so let me summarize for you number one here we we see the nature of an arahat an arahat is not the way the Mahayana like to depict them, say, oh, they, 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 they are old and they, they don't engage with people, they don't have compassion. Not true. Those are all wrong views. Yeah? You see here, Sariputta and Arahat, very engaged with the world, very compassionate, visiting Dananjani uninvited because he knows Dananjani needs help. And then he Teaches Tananjani the Dharma, remember, right? He teaches the Dharma, not, not anything else. So Tananjani has a mind of Dharma. And then he teaches the Dhananjani how to be reborn in the Brahma world. But remember, how did Dhananjani die? He knows the Dharma, he dies with the Dharma. And we know many Brahmas come to see the Buddha. For example, Gatikara. And he's a non-returner. So although the Sutta doesn't say this, we can safely imagine this Brahma, Ranjani, will out of gratefulness come down and pay respect to the Buddha and then listen to teachings. Right? That is why the Buddha didn't say anything. He said, well, he's reborn in the Brahma world with a smile, I suppose. So the whole thing, the, it's very important that nothing more is said here. With all the explanation I'm giving, because the, uh, the the new the modern teacher is supposed to give this explanation, the sutta must not explain all this because the sutta wants to highlight Sariputta's compassion, 
the arahats versatility the, the arahats are compassionate they, they look at the person they are teaching and see what kind of teaching they need and gives them that teaching so in other words this some for example if we are teaching you know especially in the west there are people who believe in god you see so okay we start with the god idea without all the you know violence and jealousy so we teach them this brahma vihara so we begin from where their faith is and then slowly we bring them into the dharma right so you, you see this kind of really amazing way that uh, the the buddha is telling us how we, we can be versatile in our dharma preaching to reach out to others at their own level and then bring them higher to the dharma in that way so you can imagine the, nothing no one has failed here it's just the approach on how we help people with compassion we help them to grow in the dharma to be free from suffering through the dharma out of compassion so this is what the majima dhananjana sutta is about so there you are i hope you enjoy the happy happy with the sutta yeah? okay now we have a bit of time for questions thank you bro pia sister i see my pass the session to you now thank you sister Wendy. Thank you, Brother Pia, for the yeah. short explanation. Uh, let me read out the first question from Brother Elsie. Okay. This sutta about not having any excuse for not practicing the Dharma and not creating bad karma. So myself giving up vegetarian for the sake of harmony with my family, friends and business associates and employees. Is it creating bad karma? I did catch the last part. You mean, can you read the last part again? Oh, sorry, sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, he mentioned that himself giving up vegetarian, vegetarian, vegetarian. for the sake of his Oh, you mean family. not being vegetarian. Ah, yeah. Is it okay. uh, he's, he, he's creating uh -huh. bad karma? Okay, very hard question to answer. Nah? Because whatever I say, then you will, will use me as an excuse. And then when, when the hell wardens come, I can't help anyway. So it's quite quite difficult here. You know? <laughs> Whether you are vegetarian or not is your choice. Okay. Uh, the, the wrong thing is the killing, remember, right? The killing. Huh? Or you cause killing to happen and then you eat. Right? So it's very tricky here. We're, very often we just go and buy and, and, and we didn't cause the killing because we go later so everything's prepared there because now the, the way the world works this killing is also mechanical right so this is the the way of to, to speak it in a to, to speak in a worldly way of course indirectly we, we still cause those animals to be killed that, that's one of the reasons why i, I also decided to be meatless yeah? I'm not a vegan like Rana, but I try to be meatless. So the, the main reason is we respect life out of compassion for these beings. No, no beings deserve to die so that we will live. And then we eat them, you know. Although they, they are they're not very intelligent beings, they're still living beings. So, and, and now you, you see slowly the world also is coming up with all this meatless meat and so on, right? So it's a choice you'll make. All right. If you don't cause the killing and the food is prepared there, technically speaking, you can eat it. Okay. As long as you know it has been not killed for you, you didn't ask for it, and it just happened to be there. In in the uh, Vinaya language is called Pawata Mang. So Pawata means available. Available meat is there, see? So you don't ask for it. So that's the best we can go. That is why the monks also accept. The Buddha allows the monk to accept all this food because it's already prepared. But the monks are not allowed to accept food which has been specially prepared for them. They cannot ask for it. Okay. So, or if they've seen the killing that, you know, and then they will be eating that animal which is killed. Right? So the rules are there. Okay. 
So we try our best in this case. We try our best to keep the first precept, all right? So please don't ask me, is this good karma or bad karma? I cannot answer the kind of question because if I'm quoted, then I also create a bad karma with you, which I don't want. You want to create bad karma, it's your choice. You're free to do that and you will, you, you're, you'll suffer for that. So you're on your own, basically. Right? It's a choice we all make. So you have to examine very carefully the situation, what you can do, how you can avoid it, use your wisdom, basically. All right? Okay, next question. Thank you, Brother Pia. The next question from Brother Patrick Poon. Mm -hmm. This sutta mention of only three wofu realms, there's hell, animals, and preta. Mm -hmm. Instead of the four wofu realms, leaving yeah. out the asuras. Perfect. Is it because this sutta assume asuras as part of Peta realm? Yeah, this is one of those interesting situations. Uh, usually asuras are not mentioned. The asuras are a very small group, you know. Uh, they, they come from the story where this uh, Sakra took over Tawat Tingsa and then these gods who were there were ousted from there. So they were called asuras. So they, they're not a very big group. That is why they, they don't form the, a realm by themselves. Uh, yeah, that, that's the thing. Right? <laughs> you can say they are devas, or you can say they, they are they are near. They're not actually pretas. They're more powerful than the pretas. They, they they actually asura means fallen devas. Okay, so I would say they they they're almost like devas, but they don't have that much power. Okay, and they are. Maybe you can even say they're suffering devas, if you like, right? Because they're, they're, they're living in, in more or less the sense world and, and they, they fight with the devas. So that means uh, they are of the same realm, right? So that's one thing we can understand that way. Only in later Buddhism, right? We, we, we take the suras as one realm, especially when we talk about Buddhist psychology, to describe the kind of mind that human beings have, the asura mind, that's a very violent and exploitative mind. Okay, but when you talk about the different realms, it's only the, the animal realm, preta realm, and how realm. Okay, uh, and then you you have the suffering human beings also one, also included in suffering states. All right. So I hope. Anyway, if you're not. Clear still continue asking until if I miss out anything, I will try to fill in for you. Okay, next question. Okay, thank you, uh, Brother Pia. Next question from Brother <laughs> MCEO. Is this Sutta teaching us how to teach others depending on the recipient capacity and not and on not according to what we need to teach? Uh well, this is a special case, yes. You know, you have Sariput, this um, Dhananjani is a Brahmin and his wife is not a Buddhist, you know. But he is a good man, but because of the wife, he became bad. So Sariputta comes along and, and, and teaches him to help him, especially him, so he's a special situation. So in the Sutta, we, we, we get we, we often get this kind of very personal situation dealing with special cases. This is to help the monks uh, understand what they have to do when similar cases arise. Yeah, yeah so in a sense, you, you're right, you know, this is a special case. But then, the, as you know, the Dhamma applies when, when we talk about keeping the precepts and so on, Dhamma faring, that applies to everyone. Here, the idea is to be, to reach out or reach down to those people according to their, their abilities and their needs. All right, next question. All right, thank you, Bharatiya. Uh, there's no <laughs> question in the chat box. Okay. Uh, yeah. Any brother and sister would like to ask verbal question, you can unmute now. Thank you. Ante, this is Ryan. Yes, go on. Yeah, I don't want to uh, um, shift the blame to, to, the, to the wife, but it would appear the wife has a lot to do with 
with uh, his uh, behavior after he his first wife passed away. Mm -hmm. So uh, Sariputta uh, went to see him and gave him some some pointers on how he should how he should lead his his life. Yeah. Yes. So it is rather skillful. He did not address his wife directly. He just addressed him. Mm. Yeah, what, what has happened and you should be mindful of all of this right. that you are doing now. Yeah. After that, we have this uh, period of time, then we, we come to, to, to the part to, to the, the part that he is dying. Mm -hmm. And now the, the teaching on the part that he's dying, of course, Sir Riputa at that time had to make a um, uh, urgent decision on how should I help this man? You know, should mm -hmm. I just uh, take a chance and then just leave mm -hmm. him my world, or should I go further? So we mm -hmm. can see uh, the the conflict that he has. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so the teaching on the pointers and the teaching on the uh, how to settle for the Brahma world mm -hmm. um, is very interesting mm -hmm. because we're talking about the Brahma world as loving kindness, compassion, gladness, and all of those things. Yes. Um, and so on, which is which is, if you if you like, on how to how to practice them, even though not knowing them. Yes. yes. Um, it is a, a, possibly there, there's a lot, a lot more, but the, mm. see that the, the huge transformation. Correct. Yeah. Is, and uh, on the uh, on, on the practice. Right. But, yeah. Thank you. So in other words, yeah. In, in a sense, this sutta is not complete. In a sense, yeah, because. Uh, Normally, when you do a sutta, we say, oh, this person had 10 stream winning, we have arahat, and so on, right? But although it's not complete, we, we know, more or less, we know in, in other suttas what the pattern is. When someone becomes a Brahma, wow, that's really high, you know? And there are many good Brahmas who come to the Buddha playing various important roles, right? For example, the Brahma who came to invite the Buddha to teach, right? So, because if they don't, you know, the, even the Brahmas, after, in the case of Dhananjani, he, his karma will, is finished in the Brahma world, then he will fall back into the suffering states. That, that would not be very good, you see. So, if we really go on to continue the Sutta, what, what is likely to happen to Dhananjani, my understanding from the other Suttas is that he would come down. So far, we, 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 we don't have that sutta. I'm not seeing the sutta. Tananjani will come down to pay respects to Sariputta and pay respect to the Buddha. And they receive teachings. And on account of those teachings, he will attain at least stream winning. In the case of Brahma, it's even not difficult for them to become non returners because they, they're already first jhana, you see. That means they already overcome sensual desire, right? So it's very easy for them to become non returners. So that part, that, that technicality is, is missing from the sutta. And we don't need to be technical here because we know more or less the natural cause of things. What will happen if, some, if someone so good in that way attains the Brahma world? Okay, he, he's not becoming a, a Brahmin or anything like that. He's attained this high level of good karma. And he has a choice. He will be inclined to show his gratitude to the Buddha and to, to Sariputta. All right, thank you for bringing the point up, Ryan. Okay, any other points? On the same subject, I, I would like to hazard a guess what happened to the wife? <laughs> yeah, the part is not mentioned. Uh, otherwise, the, you know. There'll be a distraction, I think. Maybe that's the reason. They focus on Dananjani. Because here the focusing is on the teaching. So the otherwise it'd be the story will be too it becomes very complicated and lack focus. Right. So I wouldn't say the Buddha is the, the storyteller is blaming the wife. It just that's what happens. There are often cases like that where the partner, in other cases, the husband is the one who's not a Buddhist. You know? So here, the Sutta is also saying that by nature, <clears throat> Dhananjani is a good man. And Sariputta is reminding him 
of his natural goodness, right? So to help him that way. So it is not a story. It's not a human story with all the details, uh, worldly details. It's about how we as Dharma teachers should act. I don't know whether there are other suttas dealing with difficult husbands or difficult wives. Then I suppose there are, you have to look around a bit. But in this case, it's about how to teach someone uh, who has forgotten his good, natural goodness, bring back that memory so that he's, he will practice as a good person again. It's possible. Okay. If I, if I may, uh, Bante, yeah. there's another uh, question in the chat box. Mm -hmm. Actually, this sutta, this teaching here is very um, prevalent in, in this age. No, mm -hmm. in lots of families with um, uh, different faith, uh, husband Buddhist or wife Buddhist and the other partner is not. And they, they are facing, they, they, they do different practices and the, the and, and when it comes to the children, the husband will say, oh, I leave yeah. it to the wife, or wife will say, I leave it to the husband. And this is what I can see the parallel of uh, mm. with this sutta. Yeah. Many yes. people will have this issue, actually. Very true, yeah. So this is where sometimes you have this uh, elderly person is all alone and children are converted. Mm. So very difficult for him. That's why the the task is a Buddhist as a community is to look around and to help this kind of lonely Buddhists. It's very important eh? to be able to reach out to them, give them support. All right. So those of you who like to do social work, you have time and you are, you are young enough with energy. You know, as we grow older, like in my case, you see, only a few days ago, another old friend of mine has passed away in Malacca. They keep passing away, and fewer and fewer of them. So you can see like this group photo, and then they, one by one disappearing. I say, oh dear, when, matter of time, we might turn. So, so in other words, you begin to feel very lonely. All your people you know are disappearing. You know? And the younger ones, they, they don't come to befriend you and so on, despite their talk of compassion and so on. So you, you have, to, as Buddhists, we have to build up this, connection with, with the elderly folks you know, and with, with others. Some of them are not even elderly, they're, they're younger people, but they're still quite lonely. So you got to reach out to them, right? There are other groups in Singapore, non-Buddhist groups, who do this service. You know, they, they, they go out to help the lonely old folks, clear the house for them and or, or take care of them, their health and so on. And this is what we need to do as our society modernizes. We have this urbanized families which are very atomized, no? nuclear family. You've got parents, children, that's all. No extended family. It can be quite lonely, you know. So that connection is very important, Buddhist connection. Yeah. So if you are running a Buddhist group, do think about this. Okay. Buddhism is about people caring also. And that, that's uh, one notice that Sariputta reaches out to Dhananjana. So this is a reminder for us to reach out to others. So tell your society organizers like, to this aspect of Buddhist work. Okay, any other questions? So we have a couple of minutes left. Uh, Brother Pia Desa, opinion sure. from Brother Elsie mm -hmm. He said, when a sutta is what we deem or think as incomplete, it is intentional to show us the reality of life as unpredictable or expecting the unexpected okay. to deal the natural cause yeah. of the role of yeah. the individuals. So yeah. let's sadhu be sadhu. Possible, yeah, that's true. Now, I wouldn't say the sutta is incomplete. It is my view, right? <laughs> that there are, we can, there are a lot of other conclusions we can make from it. The sutta is a purpose, it's given in that way there is a purpose behind it. That's why the Dhananjana Sutta is special, right? It gives just enough things. So it's like a, like a writer, you, you, you got to decide what you want to tell, what you don't have to tell. 
or like a, a story you see on screen, right? They won't tell you everything. It's not a history, right? It's not a history of, of something. So some parts are not told because if you start telling too many things, then the important things become lost, right? So that here there are certain themes and those themes are what are highlighted. Okay, any other? Uh, can I finish yeah. his statement? Let alone that Buddhism is also divided into so many group and schism that we are mm. mingled. Yes. And yes. Sister gets you uh, raise her hand. Mm, okay, sure. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, yes. Yeah, um, thank you, Brother Pierre. Mm. I, I just want to clarify because I was just uh, reading the bottom part um, mm -hmm. of your footnote um, on 72-73. So I, I'm just not very clear about you know the 72 footnote. So uh, now I'm just curious because uh, you, you mentioned that the commentary is silent on this point about yeah. you know when there's still a higher task to be done because the, so the Buddha actually brought up mm. the question. Mm -hmm. And then there's this uh, statement that you say the Majima reciters in a rare gesture here express their own opinion regarding Sariputta's deed, but it is recorded as the Buddha's word later. Uh, so how, how was that conclusion uh, come about that it has been recorded as the Buddha's word later? And then there's a square bracket 18. 38, I, I don't know where to look at this 38. And then, um, because I, I'm, I'm, I mean, it's just from my learning from uh, other sutta studies that okay. a lot of times the suttas can be copy and paste. So I'm just curious whether this sutta is like, um, has been left out and then whether yeah. the sutta actually subsequently <laughs> actually went on to, mm -hmm. to kind of verify how yeah, this is one of the difficulties. This is one of the difficulties when you are a, a Dharma teacher, mm -hmm. you are a Sutta scholar, or someone who you know who, who carefully reads a Sutta. You find all the Pali words there, they kind of, you know, they're not like English, you don't have inverted commas, quote marks, who is saying what, you know. In, in many cases, you have to look at it and you decide, okay, imagine who is talking now. And then how, how is the meaning brought out? How do you want to present the suttas? So sometimes you get the commentators, they would give their opinions. Sometimes uh, modern scholars, modern monks would disagree with us. Oh no, the, the, I don't agree with the commentators here. And they're perfectly allowed to do that because they're not saying I disagree with the Buddha. They're saying with the way what the commentators think. Eh? So, like I said here, this are just we are, these are called technicalities. So, who said this part? Who said that part? Eh? So, even the part where the Buddha says this Sariputta. So, I just it's my opinion. Yeah, say this suggests that the Buddha gently disapproves. Even then, I'm not sure because as, as if we look at the sutta, there, there is something more here, and the Buddha actually is telling Sariputta, well, what you have done has come to fruit. You know? So there are some things you have to read it and then decide for yourself, how does it sound to you? In your understanding of your practice, what do these lines mean to you? I don't think there is a final way of interpreting this. It will be my interpretation, see that's what I'm saying. And then the problem with my interpretation is I could be wrong, you see. Even the best teacher could be wrong because 10 years from now, he will tell you, oh, you know, <laughs> I changed my mind. <laughs> you know, many good teachers do that, you see. So you, it is wise for you to say, okay, let's take this with a pinch of salt, all right? <laughs> with a grain of salt. Uh, the important thing is what is being taught here helps in your practice. The technical details are fine. They can be spoken by way of discussion and what's called discursive talk. In other words, you, 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 you say, okay, this is what I think. The other persons will say what he thinks. And it doesn't really affect our practice. It's just that 
we are discussing the Dharma, the possibilities of uh, looking at this teaching. So we don't have a final word there. Of course, it's possible you can write a short essay or long essay and say, okay, this is what I think, scholars often do that, and they give the explanation. But then you must remember the whole explanation is there and you read it in context. So if you take just one line like that, it's quite difficult to really see what's going on. So this is an area of uh, Buddhist studies called the uh, suttas as literature, which is quite fascinating. In fact, now that there are you know, a lot of interesting uh, ways of looking at Buddhism. Okay? There's not much time, I'll just make one last note. But for example, now I'm working in an area of Buddhism, uh, volume 60 is very interesting in a way to celebrate our 20th anniversary of translation. And I have summarized all those great teachers of Myanmar and Thailand. And then I study how they create new meditation methods, right? Now in the volume, second part of volume 60, 60 B, I will be listing how, what happens to Buddhism when you go to the West, all this mindfulness movement and so on. Uh, how are they changing Buddhism? It, it's like they've taken the golden egg away from the goose, you know, and they say, oh, well, we're not going to call this an egg anymore. This is something else. You know, this egg is mindfulness. We're not we're going to call it whatever, you know. So <laughs> very interesting uh, developments. And then you have, in meditation, many of these psych psychologists have discovered that meditators face a lot of problems. You know, some of them get breakdowns, they sit for hours, you know. So it, how does how is meditation good? How is it dangerous? So, uh, so I'm listing all those research psychologists have done, and these are very valuable, important to us, so that we have a healthy approach to meditation. All right. So this is what I'm doing now in, in, in the volume part two of, of volume 16. Yeah? So if you want the uh, 60A, which gives a summary of all those great teachers, including Achancha, Pao Saido, and Ma Masi Saido, and so on, it's all there. Even with all the references, you can look up details. No? It is 200 over pages, you know. It is uh, volume 60A. So it's, it's all bound to one volume. If you want, it'd be very easy to send to you through PDF now, through the telegram. No? One last announcement is, oh, before that, Rana, would you like to take a photo shot of us first before the last announcement? Uh, yes, please. Yeah. Okay. Okay, please uh, turn on your videos. I, I love this part, I can see you all. Okay, uh, we can smile. Mm -hmm. Smile and notice your meditation, your smile, is, you feel very smooth in your meditation. Eh? Okay. All right, we are smiling right now. Yes, I'm waiting. <laughs> okay. All right. All right, Dan? Yeah. Yeah. One, two, three, smile. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Okay, last announcement is about this uh, Buddha Nama Yoga, no? which is a yoga which I've developed for myself. And I've been using it for the last two years. So now I think I'm ready to teach people. So if you want to learn it, we, we are, I'm teaching it in the Jurong Lake Gardens it's, uh, once a week or once in two weeks to see how. The program's already planned, so look at the, what do you call that, the telegram, no? we have a couple of people already signing up. So it is meant for, for you to do as you become senior, as you grow older, because these are very slow movement, it stretches your arms, it helps you to balance yourself, or this, this basic, the very simple yoga. Uh, but even then, you know, you, you got to build up slowly. And uh, the whole cycle lasts one hour. 40, 40, 45 minutes to 50 minutes, more or less. So if you do very slow, you can come to one hour. Or you can stop anytime. It's very flexible because you're doing it on your own. But most is, I think eight people can assemble at one time. I think the rules still 
you've been forced now. So if you're interested, you can ask right now. Okay, then let us remember this wonderful moment together. How we have started off by taking the three refuges and five precepts and then done some meditation and also listen to the suttas. Sila Samadhi Panya. So let us send our loving kindness to all our loved ones. May they be well and happy wherever they are, especially those who are sick and alone. Send your loving kindness to them. And also to yourself that you may be well and happy to be able to attend the sutta classes and to practice the Dhamma. <clears throat> Above all, let us show our gratitude to the three jewels by bowing down first to the Buddha, then to the Dhamma, and to the Sangha. Arahang Sama Sambuddho Bhagava Buddhang Bhagavantang Abhiwademi Well done. Swakato Bhagavata Dhammo Dhammang Namasami Pardon. Supatipano Bhagavato Savaka Sango Sangang Namami Pardon. Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. Thank you, thank you, Priya. Thank you, Sister Aisim. Thank you, everyone. Yes. Thank you so much, yes. Future Priya, Sister yes. Lena. <laughs>